Greetings, I'm Demonat, creator of the illustrated Tales from My D&D campaign and player on the Sunday Morning Heroes D&D 5e livestream. Sometimes, like last Sunday, the stream doesn't happen for whatever reason, whether it be technical difficulties or Quill 18 being out of town raising five grand for Children's Miracle Network. And when a stream doesn't happen, I take one of your suggestions and make up some RPG elements for a makeup video. This time, Artman XP suggested a merfolk bounty hunter on land. Obviously. Maru Ella and her best friend Nua loved exploring the colorful, life-filled corals, coral reefs near the shore of the continent which their people called the Sunderlands. So when they heard that a ship had gone down in Sickle Bay, they wasted no time in volunteering for fishing duty in that area. They swam out early in the morning with their spears and net sacks, anxious to see what damage had come to the crab-filled reefs, but when they saw the alien wooden behemoth that had landed on the sea bottom, their concerns for the garden-like beauty and teeming wildlife of the bay were overcome by their curiosity, never having seen the view from above the deck of a sailing ship, let alone what was inside those bizarre floating houses of men. They spent most of the morning slipping in and out of the cabins, equally shocked by the similarity of many familiar tools and items used by surface men, as by the many odd devices and symbols whose purpose they could only guess at and argue about. With time slipping by, though, Maru began to worry that they'd return with so few fish they'd be severely chided for wasting their time, so she went out to start on what she hoped to be an adequate spearfishing haul. Nua was clearly less worried and took a nap instead, promising to join her out there and fish like a tiger shark in an hour or two. When Maru's sack was beginning to fill up, though, she realized Nua had been gone a long time. Even she wasn't this lazy. She returned to the shipwreck and couldn't find her friend, and just as she was becoming very worried, she beheld an odd creature. It had a large, round, very hard-looking head, and one very long tentacle trailing upward to the surface, over a hundred feet. The rest of the creature looked less alien, more like a merman or a mermaid, but with that odd forked tail, like a man. Is that a man? She hid in the dark corners of the sunken vessel, watching the creature reach the bottom of the bay, bounding along in slow motion, upright like a seahorse. But as it snapped off coral with its heavy flippers and clumsily stirred up billowing clouds of silt, Maru's face darkened was making a beeline for the part of the ship where Nua had been sleeping. She moved around the sharp-cornered wooden shapes of the wreck, swimming swiftly closer to the big-headed thing, until it entered the cabin where Nua had been and began searching around. It picked up and examined Nua's spear and empty fish sack before discarding them and turning its large, gleaming glass eye, crisscrossed oddly by thin metal bars, right into Maru's face. The man stumbled back, falling slowly onto his rear, and she now knew it was a man, having seen the startled face behind the glass of the spherical diving helmet. The mermaid knocked his hooked rod out of his hands and tried to speak to him, knowing there was supposed to be a lot in common between her people's language and the surface dialect, but whether it was her different accent or the metal ball around his head, he didn't seem to understand. So she prodded him with her fishing spear, pushed him back out, of the shipwreck and started as though to haul him bodily upward. The men proved heavier than she thought, though he seemed equally surprised by her strength and ability to lift him around as much as she had, and he reached up and gave a double tug on the chain bound to his air hose. Moments later, those chains began winching him up toward the surface as Maru swam circles around him. She got a lot more cautious as they approached the surface. She could see movements through the wavy, distorted lens of the water-air boundary that looked like more humans up there on the shore. So she hung back as his torso was pulled out of the water, and then his legs. After a moment, she burst up into the sunlight and poked a threatening fishing spear in the direction of the man and woman who froze in the middle of removing the diver's bulky helmet. Where is my friend? This time they clearly understood. The woman helping operate the winch subconsciously glanced over towards a cart parked twenty feet back. The man who had been helping the diver dropped the helm with a heavy clunk and reached to unsheathe a sword sword, but Maru lunged forward several feet out of the water onto her belly and stabbed him in the shin. 
He fell back, and the other two, the woman and the diver, grabbed him and hauled him towards the cart, though after the woman got his arm around her shoulder, she went ahead on her own as the diver, slowed by his massive boots and other weighted leather gear, followed as best he could. Seeing a splash of water from the back of the cart, Maru let out a guttural scream of rage, though the sound of it, pitch shifted by the air, took even her a little by surprise. She grabbed some rope lying near the rock where their winch was anchored and tried to tie it to her spear, but she fumbled with fear and rage and adrenaline. As, as the woman loaded the injured man onto the cart, Maru got the knot set right, but only had time for one throw. The helmetless diver made an exhausted dive to land heavily on the back of the cart, getting just enough of his still-weighted body on to fall forward into it, splashing into the water filled back as the spear bounced pointlessly off the wooden tailgate. Maru started pulling the spear back, reeling it in with the rope, but the woman whipped the horses into action and the wagon jerked into motion, splashing water out to either side around the face-down diver's still-kicking legs. Maru shoved herself back into the sea and dived down, still reeling in her spear. There was a small river delta emptying into the bay, and the direction of the cart seemed to parallel it. Maybe she could catch up. She bolted over there like a swordfish, but not far up the stream it became clear that it was only a few feet deep and quite rocky. It was perfectly navigable for a mermaid, especially a pissed-off one desperate to rescue her friend, but she could only go one huge stroke at a time, having to pause and look for the next way ahead. There was no way to get a proper swimming rhythm to gain speed, and each time that she broke the surface to check, the cart was further away. Soon it was out of sight, though she took a longer pause, pulled herself up on the rocks, and she could see the wagon tracks still heading parallel to the river. Apparently there was some kind of road there. She kept swimming up the rocky stream, one big swerve at a time, but she was getting rapidly tired as the adrenaline bled off, and the hours of fishing started to catch up with her. And after many minutes of chasing, she came up to check the trail and found that the road and the tracks turned away from the river into the woods. Maru pulled herself up out of the river onto land and began dragging herself along, but swimming while tired was one thing. Pulling her way along with her arms, and her powerful, solid muscle tail could only push impotently against the ground, while rocks and twigs scraped the skin of her arms and dug into the scales of her flank. She pushed and pushed against the dry ground, but Toiling away, minutes felt like hours, and as exhaustion overcame her, she looked back at the stream in which she had chased them for miles, and its rocks were less than thirty feet behind her. As she closed her eyes, acknowledging defeat, the thought passed through her head that if she can't continue forward, she still has to claw her way back to the stream somehow, or she'd dry out and die in an hour or two. And that thought was crushed out of the way by the realization that Nua may be gone forever. She woke up with something warm on her face, though she groaned at the feel of her tail crackling with a terrible dryness. She had definitely been out of water too long, but she opened her eyes to a damp, driftwood gray snout prodding at her. She startled, but then stopped as she found herself staring into the dark, glassy eye of a dolphin. No, not, not a dolphin. This gray beast was on land, standing on four tall pillars, and had waves of gray hair, kind of like an old mermaid, but that big eye and the reflection of her face staring back at her from it reminded her so much of the gentle creatures that share the sea with her people. Maru slowly reached out a dry, scratched up arm, and the beast did not shy away, letting her touch its long face, and feel the strands of mane falling down over its face as it nudged her. Where do you come from? she tried to say, but she barely croaked half of it out before coughing, the dryness like a serrated knife in her throat. She realized she was badly dehydrated. Her body creaked, and she let out a breathless groan as she tried to roll and squirm her torso around, struggling to turn back towards the river. With dull thuds, a pair of the creature's pillar-like legs stomped down as it moved just slightly past her, still craning its neck down, almost presenting his long neck to her. I'm not going to make it back, she thought. Whether it was instinct or desperation, she reached up and grabbed for the top of its neck, and the animal bent its front knees to lower itself. It took all her effort, but she pushed off with her powerful tail, managed to flop herself up onto its long back, clinging to its mane, probably hurting it a little, as it straightened up and trotted the short distance to the river. 
Maru dropped off and rolled into the water, and her scales were so dry it almost burned, but she made it. She felt like she couldn't even move anymore, but the water was rushing over her. It was cool, and she basked in it, staring into the horse's eyes. She regained consciousness again hours later to see the wild horse wandering amidst the trees, feeding on the underbrush. Where did you come from? she asked quietly, though her voice sounded much more like herself already. She now recognized the horse as the same kind of strange creature that had been pulling the cart that took Nua. Nua. Everything snapped back into focus. Maru was still sore and tired, but she was alive, and Nua was still with those... those. The horse wandered closer to her. Maru had no idea where he'd come from or why he'd helped her, but she had swum alongside dolphins before, or played with them, and though she'd never seen it, she'd heard tales of them swooping in to protect a lone merchild from sharks, or worse. When she looked into its eyes, she saw something of what she'd seen in Dolphin's eyes, a mutual recognition. She pulled herself up onto the horse again, still with some difficulty, but even from mounted height, she couldn't see far enough to tell where the road went after turning away from the river. Mara realized now that she couldn't follow the kidnappers if they might be hours or days from a body of water. She paused for a moment, thinking as she ran her fingers through Driftwood's fluffy mane then patted the side of his neck, and he, he got the idea, turning and riding back in the direction of the beach. The sun was setting on the town of St. Gendi, but there were still a few people in the main street, heading to or from the tavern, a few preparing a cart, but all of them slowly turned as the stranger rode slowly down the lane. What the hell? Is that a fish on a horse? Hey, that's my diving helmet! And your hook... Perched up on driftwood, wearing the diving helm now filled with water, and with her tail looped behind her on the horse's back, Maru wielded the diver's long hook, with her own spear on a rope at her side. From horseback, she could see her friend bound underwater in the wagon, and the light of sunset reflected over her, making it hard to tell if she was all right. But now she was there. It was real. It was certain. Many of the humans were hard to tell apart, but Maru was pretty sure the diver and the woman from the beach were two of those who had spoken, and even without proper tales, their body language gave away their recognition of her. But they weren't the ones by the cart. She was pretty sure nobody could hear her speak with the spherical water helm on, so she simply, ominously, pointed the hook towards the still, water-filled cart that several men were gathered around, who stopped whatever they were doing and grouped up. Hey, we bought this pretty little fish fair and square, so why don't you ride back to wherever your scaly hide came from? Or we can take you too. Or are you all ugly under that metal thing? Maru leaned forward, and Driftwood started to trot, speeding up to a gallop towards the cart and the men, who were armed with hammers and other tools, Placing her hands firmly on the horse's sides, as she approached the men and they brandished their improvised weapons, Maru swung her tail around, whipping one of them in the face with the immensely strong hypaxial muscles of the power of merfolk swimming. That man was knocked clean off his feet, while Maru followed through, then on the backswing swung herself right off the other side of the horse into two of the men with the long hook in hand. Minutes later, in the long shadows cast by the setting sun, the gray horse carried Maru, slumping somewhat, bleeding in several places, and with a great many bruises just beginning to color up, and with Nua draped across behind her. Maru triumphed that day, rescuing her friend from shallow men who could not see past the mermaid's fish-like tails to view them as fellow sentients, or certainly not as equals. But she'd gained a new friend as well, forming a powerful bond, but one which tore at her, because Driftwood could not come back to their undersea village, but neither could Maru and Nua survive more than a couple hours out of water. The heavy, water-filled helm extended this somewhat, but their bodies would dry out after a while despite it, and of course it was massively heavy and unbalancing, though it did offer some protection. Merfolk can speak in a way that travels well through water, so if you put your face near the helm, or if she thrusts her big round metal dome intimidatingly close to you, you can actually hear the muffled speech. She can also remove the helm, turning it upside down to hold in most of the water, and speak properly. 
if she has to, since merfolk can breathe air well enough to last a couple hours on the surface in settings other than my campaign world. But she tries to avoid that. In the end, Maru visited her home sometimes, but she began spending most of her time exploring the surface world with Driftwood, finding new terrains, new towns, new foods, and gradually over time she made friends with some of the people there as well. Early on she discovered that there was a bounty on a kidnapper, and for some reason that really got under her scales. Turning the kidnapper into the authorities was an interesting conversation, but she rode away with some money to cover her and Driftwood's food costs, buy equipment, etc. Bounty hunting became a way to earn her keep up on the surface, and perversely a way to fit in, as bounty hunters are distanced from normal society in a way that makes her almost a normal outsider, clearly standing out, but in a way people sort of understood, though her often silent demeanor, being unable to be heard outside of whisper range, has led to her common, somewhat derisive nickname, Fish the Bounty Hunter. Maru rarely leaves Driftwood's back while in town, as moving around on land with a tail is slow and cumbersome, tiresome, and leaves her low to the ground, where humanoids taller than gnomes or halflings tend to look down on her, metaphorically as well as physically. She cuts an odd mounted figure with the diving helm, and with her head, her tail folded over the horse's back and the flippers hanging down one side or the other. But the helm, which makes her appear faceless and less viewed head-on from fairly close, makes her appear quite imposing to criminals. Her upper body is reasonably strong, but in any situation where she can use her tail, she can generate power which most surface dwellers find surprising. She's known for performing maneuvers where she throws herself off the horse to shocking effect, but it should be noted that it's a fish tail, not a snake-like tail like a naga. So it's strong, but not the least bit prehensile. So she acquires armor, which helps her hide the femininity of her silhouette, and fights using a hooked staff the diver had dropped back in the ship deck. Though she can use her spear-throwing skills to harpoon fleeing targets and reel them in. It didn't fit into my short story origin for her, or whatever that was, but I also really like the idea of the merfolk bounty hunter using tracking barnacles. With a little underwater magic, she could slap a barnacle onto a person's armor or wagon that attaches itself there, and then she could track its direction somehow. If used in your game, the merfolk bounty hunter could just be another unusual NPC or an interesting ally, temporary or long term, but with a little change to her backstory, for example, if Nua died, she could easily be twisted into a villain out for revenge, or perhaps a non-evil secondary antagonist, pursuing the party due to some crime they committed, thinking they could just leave town or bully their way out of any consequences. This one came out as more of a personal short story style. Some of these videos are much more technical or contain a lot more brainstorming and campaign-ready ideas. I'm going to try to find a better way to make clear in the show notes which type each episode is. Make sure to suggest your own weird or interesting ideas in the comments or on Twitter, at TalesDDC. And don't get too overly specific, because, as you see here, you never know quite what you're going to get. I will note, the number of ideas left under previous makeup videos are still bouncing around in here, waiting for me to find the right take on them. But as always, this is mainly a creativity exercise for me and for you. It's less about giving you ideas to slot into your campaign than it is to start you thinking in a direction you might not have before. Brainstorm away, whether for RPG or any fiction. Of course, if you want to see a lot of my crazy RPG ideas in action, check out the epic illustrated Tales from My D&D campaign.